Good evening. My name is Bill Lucy. I'm the chairman of the Preservation Society. And it is my honor to introduce our guest speakers tonight. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to, well, to uh, Rosecliff for our third and final presentation of our fall lecture series. We are grateful for all of you who have joined us uh, for tonight's lecture. Without you, we, th these events would not be possible. And uh, we appreciate your generous support. Uh, we'll also, I would like to uh, invite you to join us for our winter lecture series, uh, which will be happening in January and February. Those events will be taking place uh, at the Elms uh, because Rosecliff is going uh, undergoing a major renovation. We're getting a new parquet floor and a brand new roof. So for everybody that's here, look around, soak it in, because we won't be back here until next fall. So uh, tonight, we will continue our, our exploration of the Gilded Age transportation with a look at the legacy of the Transcontinental Railroad. When we invited tonight's two speakers, uh, both of them found it funny that they were being invited to the city by the sea to, discuss, to talk about trains, uh, which I, I kind of get. Uh, but as many of you know, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, who amassed most of the Vanderbilt fortune, uh, was a titan of transportation. He was just 35 years old when the first, no wonder I'm having so much trouble, I forgot to put my glasses on. <laughs> Gosh, is that a busy day? I'm so I'm sorry. Oh, much better. Oh, look at that. Um, so he's only 35 years old when the first locomotive was built uh, in the US and that was in 1829. And even before the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, uh, Vanderbilt had forged routes to California through Central America uh, by investing in shipping and shipping companies and building steamers. So the purpose for these routes was to accommodate the surge of 49ers who were heading west to California for the Great Gold Rush, which lasted from 1848 to 1855. In the 1860s, Cornelius set his sights on the railroad industry. His New York Central and Hudson River railroads operated in the Mid-Atlantic and Great Lakes regions. His enterprises connected America's communities. I look forward to learning more about the Transcontinental Railroad and the impact it had on America from our two distinguished presenters tonight, Dr. Betsy Fallman and Dr. Munu Karuga. How did I do? Good. Dr. Fallman is a professor of art history at Arizona State University and an adjunct curator of American art at the Phoenix Art Museum. She has had a career long fascination with the relationship of American art and the industrial and technological themes. Her essays in railroad heritage include Steam and Power, Joseph, Joseph Pinnell's 1919 Railroad Series, and The Engines of Art, The Railroad as a Cultural Icon. Dr. Fallman also serves on the board for the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Karuga, who is an assistant professor of American studies at Barnard College, where he has taught since 2014. He's the author of The Emperor's, Empire's Tracks, Indigenous Nations, Chinese Workers, and the Transcontinental Railroad, published by the University of California Press. Dr. Karuga, will reframe the building of the Transcontinental Railroad in a global context, including from the perspectives of First Nations and Chinese migrants who built its tracks. There will be a brief question and answer period following the presentation for those of you who are present here tonight. Please help me in welcoming our first presenter, Dr. Betsy Bauman. How do I get my images on the screen? Are they there? Okay. Is this on? Okay. Okay, across the continent, I added a line that I didn't tell <laughs> Kate about, um, but I realized I'm, I am chronically devoted to the, co the colon in a title and it's hard for me to get rid of it. Um, first slide. 
Western Wonderlands is a Union Pacific Railway pamphlet that promotes the Grand Canyon. So it's appropriate that I bring you greetings from Arizona and the Grand Canyon State. Um, my talk will have two parts. One will be about early railroad imagery and then tourism. So it isn't totally on the transcontinental railroad. So one might think of it not only as the long 19th century, the long transcontinental railroad going into the 20th there. Railroad executives were quick to see the possibilities for tourism and non-business travel. And while the Santa Fe spanned from Chicago to California, their tourist efforts, as well as those of their partner in food and lodging, the Fred Harvey Company were concentrated in New Mexico and Arizona, but back to the 19th century. I owe apologies to Fanny Palmer, Palmer and Carlos Schwantes for poaching both of their titles. Um, on the screen is Fanny Palmer's fa famous 1858 lithograph. She was the only woman to work for Courier and Ives. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. We see a group of buildings on the settled edge of civilization. These structures include a public school and residences, a group of four men on the left busily clear land for more buildings. At least three Conestoga wagons are loaded and will soon be pulled by teams of oxen headed west. Telegraph poles are busily being raised as far as the eye can see, though these would be replaced in, after 1869 by a more efficient multi-wire system by the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railway lines. A train steams westward full of people, and we see by the straight line of the tracks that long before long, the land, all the land we see in the distance will be developed. Blue skies beckon the settlers inexorable journey westward. On the lower right, a group of Native Americans are cut off by the railroad and one assumes progress and are about to disappear in a cloud of steam. John Gass' famous Progress, American Progress of 1872, features the floating female figure of Columbia. She is a sort of Macy's balloon for settler colonialism. Good, good you laughed at that. Her position above the fray inspires those below her impelled by manifest destiny, which divinely confirmed the right of their travels and the claims that they had to go ever westward. Those below her travel by wagon, on horseback, by stagecoach, on foot, and by train, too are visible in the scene. Native Americans look back anxiously, their traditional lands being taken over by an ever expanding crowd of settlers. The single most famous photograph in the history of railroads is on the screen. It's the one by Andrew Russell recording the, the champagne celebration following the driving of the last spoke at Promontory Summit, Utah, on May 10th, 1869. Russell gained considerable experience working in the field during the Civil War and was hired to photograph the construction of the Uni Union Pacific Railroad between 1868 and 1869 in Wyoming and Utah territories. He published some of his images in a album of 50 tipped albumen prints and accompanying text. The Great West illustrated in a series of photographic views across the continent taken along the line of the Union Pacific Railroad, that's one comma, west from Omaha, Nebraska with an annotated table of contents giving a brief description of each view of its peculiarities, characteristics and connection with the different points on the road. The railroad would, that's a very long <laughs> title. I would encourage my students not to have one quite so heavy. The railroad would construct a dense web of interconnecting routes, making possible the economic development of vast reaches of the continental United States. Settlers traveled long distances to settle the regions opened up by the railroad as seen as this image of a packed and noisy interior of an immigrant car headed west. Better off travelers enjoyed greater comfort and amenities, but whatever one's class and circumstances, it was a long and dangerous journey. This image is not by Bierstadt, but it brings to mind Albert Bierstadt's The Last of the Buffalo of 1888, which suggests it was Native Americans who have decimated the buffalo herds. But by the time Bierstadt painted his canvas, the buffalo were on the verge of extinction. The animals had been reduced to a population of only about a thousand from the 30 million at the beginning of the century. 
This image of a successful Gilded Age hunt vividly conveys Victorian excess, and there's certainly no buffaloes that have been captured or shot here. And we return now to the Gilded Age for a few minutes. The long Gilded Age is rooted in the late 19th century and extravagances continued throughout the early decades of the 20th. Commissioned by Nevada silver heiress Teresa Tessie Fair Ulrichs, who had been born in Virginia City, Nevada in 1871, her fortune derived was one of several heiresses derived from the considerable wealth generated by the Comstock load. The Ulrichs were two of the many who built cottages in Newport at a great distance from the raw capitalism of Western mining. In 1899, she con commissioned the splendid house by Stanford White, who modeled Rosecliff on the Grand Trianon. French models were popular. Marble House was inspired by the Petit Trianon. We ran out of Trianons at that point. New money needed historic inspiration to ensure respectability. Tessie may have been born in Virginia City, but she would not have stayed there for long. Mining towns were insalubrious places to live, alternating hot and cold depending on the season and always dusty and dirty. Photographer Carlton Watkins visited Virginia City between 1875 and 1876 and made photographs. He found it a foul, foul place. He needed two fowls to make that clear. With severe weather, water laced with arsenic little plant life and constant noise from the stamping mills, but it was fabulously profitable. And in the second year Watkin was there, the yield from the mines was more than half of the gold and silver produced in the entire United States. Uh-oh, did I turn it off? I think I did, right? How do I turn it back on? There, how about that? That's the Comstock load. This is not. The Vanderbilts hired Richard Morris Hunt to design the breakers constructed in 1893 and 1895. Their fortunes were grounded in Gilded Age transportation, steamships, and the New York Central. And here we see the sort of web, the Vanderbilt web of the New York Central system. The Berwyn fortune came from coal. Their house, the Elms, was designed by Philadelphia architect uh, Horace Trumbauer in 1901. And here is the source of their wealth, the Berwyn coal mining um, company and coal piers and barges at Jersey City, just to remind you, and now a house outside, this is in New York. Thomas Hastings, principal in the firm of Carrier and Hastings, who designed the New York Public Library, designed Henry Clay Frick's New York mansion, constructed between 1912 and 1914. He also had a house in Pittsburgh, the base of his um, steel operations. And on the screen, I have Joseph Pennell's um, on the way to Bessemer. Printmaker Joseph Pennell was fascinated by what he called the wonders of work and traveled throughout the United States and Europe seeking subject matter. Here we see on the way to Bessemer an etching inspired by Pittsburgh's many, many steel mills, which ran 24 seven. Railroads had industrial as well as passenger and freight. And I'll show you one other panel. No other artist of the progressive era captured the power of the industrial sublime, as did Pennell. His etching of 1919, the trains that come and the trains that go, transforms Philadelphia's train station into something resembling the Gare Saint-Lazare in Paris. My Europeanist friends will probably cringe at that comparison, but I'm a good Americanist here. So. The railroads were, could be justly proud of their technological achievements. Early milestones included the Staruka Viaduct, whose great stone arch bridge spans the Staruka Creek near Lanesboro, Pennsylvania, completed in 1848 at a cost of $320,000, equal to more than $10 million in today's money. It was, a, at the time, the world's largest stone railway viaduct <clears throat> and was thought to be the most expensive railway bridge in the world. Griff Teller, Teller is best known for his annual cal calendars for the Pennsylvania Railroad. This shows a thing completed in 1854 by the Pennsylvania Railroad as a way to reduce the westbound grade to the summit of the Allegheny Mountains. The Horseshoe Curve replaced the time-consuming Allegheny Portage Railroad, the only other route for large vehicles. 
Today's travelers, and I can speak from experience on this, can still view the impressive sight of the entire train visible from being inside the railroad. And Pennell would have regarded that as a wonder of work for sure. William Rao, who worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad, was appointed official photographer for the Lehigh Valley Railroad in 1895. He traveled in an elaborately equipped passenger car, complete with a darkroom, parlor, and roof-mounted camera platform as he surveyed the length of the line from New York City through Pennsylvania to upstate New York. Using familiar conventions of earlier Western landscape photography, he combines scenic views with details of industrial progress, demonstrating that industry and technological developments could coexist within a modern landscape. So it's sort of the machine in the garden uh, view that he had. Um, I'll now switch to tourism, which brings me into the 20th century. And what we see is Mary Jane Coulter's buildings for the Grand Canyon. It's the largest group of built historic buildings by a woman anywhere in the, in the United States, as far as I know, because she did quite a few of them. The Grand Canyon was the signature site for her work and her handsome architecture, which provided a series of experiences for visitors with places to rest at altitude, to shop and to eat. Coulter was a rare woman architect in, the, um, in this period. The only other person who came close to her was Julia Morgan, who worked for the Hearst family, and Coulter worked for the Fred Harvey Company and the Santa Fe, the Santa Fe Railroad. She'd begun her career with the Hotel Alvarado in Albuquerque, designing a, um, the Indian building interior there. We'll see more of that. Her first building on the rim was Hopi House, the center for re the retail enterprise at the canyon. And you can still buy postcards with a Fred Harvey bag on them. Artists were in residence, including for a season or two, the famed Hopi potter, Nampeo. And here, oh, I did that again. Yes, okay, twitchy, twitchy thumb. Um, this is the interior of Hopi House, and it doesn't look like a regular sales room. It looks like your home if you lived in the Southwest. Um, but it's domestic in scale, and tourists could imagine the artifacts that they purchased within their home. So it was a very successful, successful venture. Railroad executives were quick to see the possibilities for tourism, as I've mentioned. While the Santa Fe Railway spanned Chicago, from Chicago to California, 3,000 miles of hospitality, um, <clears throat> their tourist efforts as well as though out of their partner in food and lodging, the Fred Harvey Company, were concentrated in New Mexico and Arizona. With the exception of El Tavar, all the major buildings on the rim and down to Phantom Ranch on the, and on the route west were by Coulter. Fred Harvey Company pioneered railroad dining. If you go on Amtrak, railroad dining is not the reason to take it, right? Um, first doing meals at hotels en route, where skilled Harvey girls served a three-course meal that had parent passengers back on the train in half an hour. This was the original fast food. They later established very elegant dine dining cars. <laughs> I have to say, Coulter outlived the great era of railroad travel. Her hotels began to be demolished during her lifetime as cars and planes became the, pre the preferred means of travel for tourists. <clears throat> By the late 1870s, the Santa Fe Railway was making its way southwest, more or less following the original Santa Fe Trail. In Lon McGargie's painting, Navajos Watching the Santa Fe Train of 1911, we see a group of Native Americans anxiously watching the arrival of the railroad that would soon change their lives. One of the most famous trains for the Santa Fe was the Super Chief, which took its first trip in 1936. And it was fast. It only took 36 hours and 49 minutes, averaging 60 miles an hour from Chicago to Los Angeles. Some of you may have experienced late Amtrak trains that do this, can do the same thing today um, there, but um, they publicized that wonderful. There. Also, painters sort of made the connection between the super chief, which you see steaming by. This is Hernando Fia, the meeting of the chiefs, which is not just the super chief, but this was from 1929. And then posters um, would proclaim the chief is still chief. Juan McGargie's chief, um, the chief extra fine, extra fast, and extra fair. <laughs> he reminds them between Chicago and California. 
The Indian detours were another distinctive thing of the Santa Fe Railway uh, from New Mexico. You could be taken by a Cadillac Harvey car with very well-educated guides. You could be comfortable and they were dressed in the latest Southwestern fashion. So here we have the Indian detour but my favorite Indian detour is this one. And if you look carefully, this Cadillac has come out to the middle of nowhere. There just happened to be Native Americans having things that they could buy. And that is, the, that is a rock formation in Wyoming, not in New Mexico. So um, they mix their metaphors a little bit. In 1892, the railroad invited Thomas Moran to the Grand Canyon to make a series of paintings and return for the copyright for one of them. This was the beginning of the first corporate art collection in America, which it, with which it continues to expand. Several decades um, into the 20th century, they continued to buy and commission work, sending the artists on trips on their trains to go to the sites to publicize what they did. Um, it still um, gets acquisitions and works have been deaccessioned from it, but um, they also bought a lot of work by women, not because they wanted to promote women. They just wanted every Western painter to be part of their collection. And here we see Grace Ravlin's San Geronimo Day in Taos from 1916. The Native American ceremonies, particularly the snake dance, were especially popular with tourists who regarded the indigenous population in New Mexico as completely unchanged and exotic from its ancient, ancient color, cover. Um, Marion Cavanaugh Wachtel, the Pueblo Awalpi, a watercolor. This is still in the BNSF collection. And we move to the Great Northern Railway. So here's their timetable from 1931 um, by Weinold Rice, who did a number of works for them. This is the new empire builder. And I think that makes clean, clear the confirming the imperialist desires of the corporation. <clears throat> this is Weinold Rice. After his first trip to Montana in 1920, Rice was able to return to Glacier Park many times in a long-lasting collaboration with the Great Northern Railway. His works illustrated the railway's See America First campaign that promoted travel to the crown of the continent on calendars, menus, playing cards, and souvenirs for 30 years, thus reaching a, a wide audience. <clears throat> the Burlington Northern also established an art collection with similar goals to the Santa Fe, but it is not well, as well known as the Santa Fe's collection, which benefited from much easier access to popular tourist sites in the Southwest. When the Burlington Northern merged with the Santa Fe Railway in 1996, the collections were also merged and moved to Fort Worth, Texas. And I'll show you a couple of artists from them who are less well known. Boston portrait painter Marion Boyd Allen came late to a career as a professional artist at the age of 40. She was 60 years old when she made her first trip to the American West in 1922. She described as a chubby, motherly little woman, one writer observed, you wouldn't think she was capable of such a life in the Rockies. Yet the artist did not hesitate to ride many miles over rough trails and to live in isolated cabins to get material for painting. And a friend declared that Alan loves and understands mountains, taking risks and undergoing hardships, which would frighten many a painter. In order to show those who, who have never um, braved mountaintops, with the idea of their grandeur. Mount Rainier on the screen, which he painted in 1929, presents a distant view of the Nisqually Glacier. The artist wrote of her experience portraying Washington's highest peak. Rainier is a dangerous mountain to climb, even with guides. Two lives were lost the week before I arrived. While I was painting this canvas, several bears came for their morning bath in the pool. One large brown bear came out of the water and directly up to my easel, sniffing the canvas and examining my Kodak, which I held in my hand. I didn't, I will not attempt to say that I was easy in my mind, but I understood that it was bad form to run away. <laughs> So stood my ground until his curiosity was satisfied, my visitors strolled off into the forest. That took a bit of sang froid to have a, a particularly a brown bear um, come up to you. Adolf Heinz is another one. Um, in the summer of 1927, he made his first trip to the west to Paint Glacier National Park for two months, making 27 canvases. This work led to a commission from the Great Northern Railroad to make 12 more paintings of the region to be used for advertising. He was excited about the opportunity. It will mean many miles of 
travel on horseback with a guide and a pack horse with materials. Commencing at 4.30 a.m., he didn't quit until 9 p.m. He was started in the a.m. The landscape was stunning. I have had thrilling experiences of traveling over the rugged, steep mountain passes. He found that the finest effects are early morning and sunset. Located in Alberta, just north of the United States border in Waterton States National Park, the Prince of Wales Hotel. I mean, this is, fan this is a Walt Disney type hotel named after the future King Edward, whom they hoped would stay on his Canadian tour, was built by the Great Northern Railway between 1926 and seven. It is the only one built in Canada by an American company. Seven stories high and topped with a 30 foot bell tower, it featured 90 rooms and was the largest wood structure in Alberta when it opened. Like the Great Northern, the Canadian Railway also built a splendid series of luxury hotels in the West. You can still stay at those. Heinze's magical view of the picturesque architecture reveals his pleasure in the summer world of clear sides above uplands where flowery meadows border the lakes, reflecting mountain peaks and the azure skies above them. Set on an island above a pretty lake from the great lobby, safely from bears, um, uh, tourists can tourists can gaze out at the Canadian Rockies that surrounded the hotel. <clears throat> a poster featuring Heinze's painting be beckoned tourists to heed the call of the mountains. I'll end my comments with a CRPNA, and it took a little bit for Kate to find my membership in that. As I said, I've had a long interest in the relationship between industrial archaeology um, and, and industry. I am this only the second member of the board of the Center for Railway Photography and Art. Um, so that tells you it's usually a guy thing, the railroad stuff. But, um, and you can ask a question, and about 15 minutes later, you will have your question answered, and many more you didn't ask. So anyway, it is a group that was founded in, 19, in 1997 and is based in Madison, Wisconsin. Its mission is to preserve and present significant images of railroading, and they indeed have that. They have 500,000 images in their archive now, and they're getting more. There are also many railway museums, great and small, throughout the nation, if railways are your obsession, which preserve the tangible artifacts of the great eras of the American Railroad, including narrow gauge and rolling stock. Among the best are the California State Railway Museum in Sacramento, the Baltimore and Ohio Railway Museum in Baltimore, and the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg. I will end with a puff of smoke for you to transition to the next talk. This also is a Joseph Pennell from that same 1919 series depicting the train yard in St. Louis, but how can you tell? there. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I hope you're all doing well and you enjoyed this beautiful day we had today. Um, research and writing can be a really lonely enterprise. So it's always wonderful to be able to share your work. Um, with, uh, with new faces and hopefully new friends. And so I'm gonna share some of the work and ideas from my book, Empire's Tracks, and I hope they'll be valuable and generative for, for your thinking and for our conversation. Okay. Thanks. The image is up, can you see it? Okay, great. Um, so Charles Springer kept a journal while serving on a campaign against Lakotas, uh, known by outsiders as the Sioux, over the summer of 1865. The place itself, which the US Congress had granted to the Union Pacific Railroad by legislative fiat, haunted Springer and his fellow soldiers, one of them crying aloud during the night of July 2nd, the devil is shifting his hindquarters. I can smell brimstone. In early August, as he wrote, in the country of the dreaded Sioux nation, Springer noted the presence of his black servant, Sam, who he felt deserves the title of comrade for helping the company to survive in such a hostile place. Imagining imperial expansion as, an op as opening some space for transforming black servitude into the appearance of magnanimous multiracial solidarity. In August, Springer and several of his comrades desecrated Lakota graves and then as the weather turned sharply cold in early September, the company withstood three attacks. The Harold soldiers speaking bitterly 
of surviving a brutal civil war only to be sent to suffer in Lakota country. We swore mutually that this trip should be the last of our soldier life. As the north wind chilled their bones, the company's uniforms ran threadbare. And on the morning of September 9th, a horrid sight presented itself to our eyes. 250 horses and mules had either died or had become so weak they had to be shot. The rain and cold still continued. We took our breakfast in silence. Everybody thought, what will become of us if this weather continues so? Over the course of their ordeal, the company had mapped sites of Lakota winter camps, empirical knowledge which the US Army would put to tactical and genocidal use in later years. On October 18th, Springer encountered two former comrades who had married Lakota women and who earned money as interpreters. Springer rejected their suggestions that he do the same, yearning instead to return to the United States. His journal recorded two options for white men in this country, assimilate to indigenous terms of relationship or leave. Springer was part of a detachment that had been sent to protect surveying crews for the Union Pacific Railroad. What I wanna emphasize is their sense of being intruders, of finding themselves in a foreign and unfriendly country. Journals and letters of US soldiers deployed in the central and northern plains during these years mark a profound bitterness. They had signed up to defeat the Confederacy and defend the Union. Instead, they found themselves fighting in another country, protecting surveying and construction crews working for a massive corporation. My core aim in this book, Empire's Tracks, is to provide a history of the United States through the lens of imperialism. And I do this at the site of the Transcontinental Railroad. Habitually, historians argue that the railroad was a project of construction that sought to establish US control over trade with China. And it had the unanticipated effects of completing a national infrastructure, which enabled the development of a national economy and a corresponding national culture. Some of the same historians who write about the railroad, who seem so concerned with the fundamental foreignness of the past, argue that the completion of the railroad and of the national political economy it facilitated were inevitable. So one of the things I wanna recapture is the sense of the people on the ground that there was nothing inevitable about this railroad and about it being completed. We saw the picture, the famous picture of, uh, of the, uh, the ceremonial completion of the transcontinental railroad. This is the golden spike that Leland Stanford apparently hammered into the ground. It's on, it's on display at Stanford University. So at the ceremony for the Transcontinental Railroad's completion, Leland Stanford, former governor of California and president of the largest corporation chartered in the state, former advocate for Asian exclusion and employer of the largest Chinese workforce in the country, Stanford hammered a symbolic golden spike into the track to finish the entire line. Now, as we heard, there was a champagne ceremony beforehand. Stanford was a bit wobbly. Um, he swung and he missed entirely, he missed the spike. Um, but the journalists who were there ran and telegraphed the news that the railroad line had com been completed. The New York Times front page the next morning in huge letters across the entire page says, done. Railroads provided the actual tracks for the development of the modern industrial corporation, for modern financial institutions, and for the development of managerial and shareholder classes. The US federal government granted millions of acres of unceded indigenous lands to railroad corporations, which capitalized these lands in order to sell corporate shares. The railroads carried credit and debt, as well as guns and ammunition. Colonialists going in and resources going out. If you see these wide bands of white west of the Mississippi River, these were lands that were granted by Congress to corporations to their direct holdings. And in doing so, they violated treaties that Congress had signed with the indigenous nations um, of those lands. In Empire's Tracks, I take aim at core elements of US nationalist mythology the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad through the agency of pioneering entrepreneurial genius, 
the tragic narrative of the colonization of Plains Indians that provides either a booster shot or a palliative for US exceptionalist ideologies and the brutal exploitation of Chinese workers who somehow by experiencing this exploitation somehow exhibit the multicultural promise of the United States. Rather than nationalism, I demonstrate that each of these processes took place at the nexus of war and finance or imperialism. By writing the history of the transcontinental railroad through the distinct histories of Cheyennes, Lakotas, Pawnees, and Chinese workers, I hope to demonstrate that imperialism, not nationalism, can help us understand the history of this continent and the task at hand for liberation struggles. So there are three core themes undergirding the arguments of Empire's tracks. The first is continental imperialism. To conceive of the United States in national terms is to naturalize colonialism. There's no national territory of the United States. There are only colonized territories. There's no national US political economy, only an imperial one, which continues to be maintained not through the rule of law, contract, or competition, but through the renewal of colonial occupation. In the US framework, there's no national law that can be distinguished from conquest. We become accustomed to understand imperialism in terms of cultural dominance. In Empire's Tracks, I analyze imperialism as the nexus of war and finance. When we understand the history of North America in the framework of continental imperialism, we can understand the history of this continent in relation to the histories of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. For example, the transcontinental network that was built in North America was built during the same historical period as the construction of the railroad network in Southern Asia. This is the map that you're seeing now. So they used the same technology. Some of the same engineers worked on these two railroad networks. Um, the same organization of production, same mechanisms of raising capital. Once these rail networks were finished, railroad construction began to take a faster pace on the African continent and in China. In each of these places, imperial powers coordinated their military and financial resources to build infrastructures that would help them extract rent and resources and fend off the claims of rival imperialists. This is the map, you've all heard of the scramble for Africa. This is the kind of material manifestation of the scramble for Africa. And you can see these railroads, they go from spaces in the interior to the coast. So these were European, the great powers, racing to build these railroads so they could capture control of valuable uh, gold fields um, and, and agricultural areas. The book's second theme is counter sovereignty. Studying American Indian history raises the core question about historical transformations of native sovereignty. This in turn can raise questions about the nature of US sovereignty. What makes the United States a sovereign entity? What establishes the sovereignty of the United States? I argue that the sovereignty of the US is actually a position of reaction to distinct indigenous protocols governing life in the spaces the United States claims as its national interior. And this is what I term counter sovereignty. Recognition of prior and ongoing indigenous collective life provides a substructure to stabilize US property claims. So this is an image um, that was advertising this new land that had been granted to the Central Pacific Railroad to investors in the Midwest and the Eastern United States. People didn't know what this place was. This was a foreign country. So it had to be described. It had to be kind of, you know, it, it had, there had to be some kind of entice, enticement of people to, to think about investing in these lands. My invocation of counter sovereignty proceeds first from a sense that settler invocations of sovereignty require recognition of distinct indigenous modes of relationship, however muted or displaced, in order to maintain any semblance of stability or coherence. This can be seen in the land grants that fueled Central Pacific Railroad production. Um, this is a map, a contemporary map of the Pyramid Lake Reservation. And if you see at the very bottom of the map, you can see Route 80. And um, that roughly follows the path of the Central Pacific Railroad. So it kind of cuts through the southern tip of the reservation. At the time that the railroad was built, 
this area was heavily forested. So it was really valuable land for, for timber. And both the Pyramid Lake Paiutes and the Central Pacific entered this longstanding uh, dispute, legal dispute over whose legal claim took precedence. Underlying any stability and coherence of Central Pacific claims of exclusive land ownership was recognition of the prior Paiute and other indigenous claims on that same land. Barring any such recognition, however displaced or muted, Central Pacific claims to land would themselves be vulnerable to the same relations of conquest, whether through market terms or through force, that established and sustained a colonial order over Paiute territory. Counter sovereignty, as visible in Central Pacific land grants and elsewhere, was a project of balancing the chaos and violence of colonialism on one side of the ledger, that of the implicitly recognized indigenous sovereign, in order to establish political and economic space for the settler sovereign. The United States declares its existence in reaction to complex networks of relationships between humans, non-human life forms, and inanimate processes that together constitute a distinct place in the world. Counter sovereignty as a mode of political authority is closely linked to counterintelligence, counterinsurgency, and counterrevolution, all modes of reactive anxiety, fragile modes of power that can take overwhelmingly violent form. These are core modes of US authority. We should understand that indigenous politics do not ultimately rest on culturalist or mystical claims on blood and soil as the far right would have it. Instead, indigenous collective life and struggle are positioned as a core contradiction of US political economy. The third theme of the book is modes of relationship. The history of capitalism is multiple and multifaceted. The challenge of comprehending actually existing capitalism, whether historically or in the present, is a challenge to comprehend a differentiated unity. Capitalism bears distinct colonial and racial histories. Against the vision of a unitary capitalism, subsuming non-capitalist modes of relation under its logic, Empire's Tracks examines how capitalism proceeds in reaction to prior and ongoing modes of relationship. At stake, is the flourishing of life in indigenous places. So I read the work of three indigenous feminists, Ella Deloria, this is the cover of her classic book, Water Lily, Sarah Winnemucca and Winona Leduc, for the ways that they theorize capitalism as a distinct mode of relationship, one that ultimately produces isolation, partition, and mass extinction. A Dakota mode of relationship, as Deloria presented it, is oriented around the creation of life, the expansion of kinship relations, and the establishment and maintenance of peace. It is, in other words, the social reproduction of peaceful inter interdependence. The emphasis is on social forms of relationship. For Sarah Winnemucca, theorizing colonial warfare, lack of relationship is a basis for the violence of invasion and occupation through a refusal or incapacity for consciousness. This includes ecological destruction. Moving up the Carson River, Winnemucca and her family met a relative who shared the devastating news that scores of their relatives had died after drinking water from the Humboldt River, which settlers had poisoned. Violence against Paiute lands and waters is an attack on Paiute collective life. Winona Leduc theorizes an indigenous mode of relationship which is collective, which spans myriad species and which fosters more life in a place. Colonialism, on the other hand, seeks to annihilate the collective, destroying and homogenizing life and consciousness in place. This map, each of these different, this is a map of the plains in North America. Um, and Leduc writes about this as the most complex ecosystem on the continent. Each of these colors is a different grass species that evolved over generations in the plains. And each of these grass species then is kind of the basis, the foundation for this extremely complex web of life. Uh, insects, birds, mammals, all the way up to and including especially the buffalo. Each grass, the, it kind of, ref, it, um, it, it, it evolved based on the number of frost days in that particular part of the world, um, the availability of water underneath the ground and then the amount of rainfall average and then the movement of the buffalo that would seed 
um, these different species. So, and Leduc writes that this map of this very complex map of biodiversity has been replaced by monocrop cultivation of soybean and, and, uh, and corn. So where indigenous modes of relationship work through interdependence, colonialism works through dependency. Where indigenous modes of relationship provide a context for individual voices to differentiate themselves, colonialism homogenizes. So to give a brief glimpse of how I use these themes to think about this history, the sixth chapter of the book considers the Union Pacific Railroad from the perspective of the history of the Pawnee Nation. The US signed a series of treaties with the Pawnees beginning in 1833. In these treaties, the United States promised to provide farming tools and implements, as well as farmers, to teach Pawnees how to grow food on their lands. Of course, they had been growing food Grandmothers have been growing food for generations, but the U.S. pledged to teach how to grow food. The U.S. The US also pledged to fund and operate schools for Pawnee children. As I argue in this chapter, both of these promises were intended to break the knowledge and relationships of Pawnee women who had farmed their land for generations, and in particular of Pawnee grandmothers who played a central role in their grandchildren's lives. Despite its resources, and that despite the use of violence to impose those resources. Um, I think there was one year I found a record, the principal of the school said, we only had three children die this year. It was, it was a great year um, for health in our school. So despite the use of violence to impose the resources, the US did not succeed in dislodging Pawnee women's work, skills, and relationships for decades. In 1861, Pawnee women were farming five times the acreage compared to the agency farmers who were paid through the treaty. They actually increased the amount of land that they were farming over these decades. This is a living history. I end this chapter in 2009 in a field of Pawnee eagle corn growing in a field of sunflowers on the banks of the Platte River. When Pawnees were moved to Oklahoma, Pawnee women carried their seeds with them, but the seeds didn't really take in the heavier clay soils and the hotter climate of their new home. Some of the women carefully preserved these seeds and passed them down over generations to their daughters. And they're now being cultivated in what we now call Nebraska, surrounded by miles upon miles of monocrop corn grown and processed by monopoly agro-corporations. Imperialism is dominant, but it's ridden with contradictions and it's not permanent. The roots of Pawnee and other indigenous modes of relationship are deep and they can be one productive site to push the contradictions in the direction of liberation. Thank you. Um, whatever you prefer, I think if you'd like to come up here. Thank you so much, Dr. Karuga and Dr. Fallman for your fascinating lectures. At this point in the evening, we'd like to open it up to question and answer. If anyone would like to begin. We stunned you into silence. <laughs> anyone at all? Oh, over here, of course. <laughs> So I was wondering how the, uh, the indigenous peoples maintained their lifestyle throughout generations up to this point, or did they? Um, thanks. Um, I think, so I'm teaching a course on indigenous feminism now with my students. And one of the things we're learning is about how um, there are these long histories of of transformation, um, organic transformation that happens within indigenous communities, um, just as was you know long histories of transformation happening within Asia, within Europe, um, and so within among the Pawnees, among the Lakotas, among the Cheyennes, um, the Paiutes, we see these processes of, of transformation that have been underway before and continue. And the transformation really is about you know how does this community keep itself 
as a distinct community, maintain a sense of distinctiveness in the world? How do you pass on the language? Um, and how do you live in the place where you live? Um, how do you feed? How do you feed everybody? How do you make sure everybody is healthy? Um, so a lot of the ideas about, you know, growing food, um, medical knowledge um, have adapted as technology has come in. There's a story um, that I end the chapter on Cheyenne's with where um, news of the ghost dance had arrived in Cheyenne communities. You know, there's a prophet out West. Um, there's a vision that has to do uh, with, uh, you know, salvation for native people. And there were people in isolated villages who heard this news and they decided we, we should send people out there to find out mm -hmm. about this. And there, were, there was a group of elders that were, that were given this task, go west, um, learn about this prophecy and see if it can be of any use for our community. So this group of men, um, older men, they set out on foot and they followed the railroad tracks. This was kind of an orienting path for them, right? Uh, they, they took, they, at one point they, they, there was a train that stopped and they, they waited for it and they got onto the train. Um, they had treaty rights with the corporations. Um, the, the transcontinentals actually had signed treaty rights of, of passage, free passage for different native communities, um, people who lived uh, in the pathway of the railroad. Um, native folks could ride in the cattle cars, not in the human cars, but they could ride in the cattle cars for free. So these men were in the cattle cars and somebody came and, and asked them, why are you here? Do you have, did you pay for a ticket? And, um, and motioned, for the engineer to slow down the, the train and, and then threw the men off the train. They didn't even stop the train. So these are older men, but anyway, so they somehow dusted themselves off and kept walking, but they followed the train track. So the, my point is that there's new technology um, and people use it, but not necessarily in the ways that we would assume it's used, but they find use for it. Um, and the use is about this fundamental question, how do we stay who we are in a changing world? I hope that is useful, a useful answer. I wanna add something to your feminism in indigenous art. I, a friend of mine just wrote a book on Navajo weaving in the, in the depression. And the government of course did all these studies, right? The people, the people who do the weaving are women. They talked to the Navajo men, they didn't talk to the women and they did all these studies and all they had to do was go to Mrs. Begay and say, what kind of wool do you want? And she would have said, churro. And they wouldn't have had to spend all that money, but they didn't talk to the women at all. So, Talk to the women. Talk to the women. <laughs> My advice. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Fallman or Dr. Kruve? Um, thank you for both of your perspectives. Um, do you see any parallels happening now in the world, you know, in terms of imperialism and transportation? Where to start? <laughs> um, that's, that's a better question for you. Um. Okay, well, um, one, you know, we, we all know and remember what happened at Standing Rock. Um, and, you know, not just transportation, but pipelines um, continue to be major sites of indigenous protest. Um, in Canada right now, there's the Wet'suwet'en uh, encampment, which is trying to block the construction of a, of a natural gas line um, through their territory. Um, so the histories of the 19th century remain surprisingly fresh. In Standing Rock, um, this, when, Standing, when Standing Rock came to the United States to uh, make a legal case for ending the permits, the environmental review to clear the, uh, the production of the Dakota Access Pipeline, they um, invoked the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which is the last treaty the United States signed um, with the Lakotas. And one of the interesting things, before I studied native history, I just had the assumption that all of these treaties were treaties of defeat, that the United States was victorious and the indigenous peoples were defeated which is actually, once you start to study it, you see it's very rarely actually that that was what happened. In the case of 1868, historians are very clear that it was the United States that came to sue for peace. Um, they weren't sure they had the resources to keep a military conflict going with the Lakota. So it's quite significant that in such recent time, the Standing Rock invoked this treaty that their ancestors signed from a position of strength for peace, 
uh, in order to end the construction of the, of the pipeline through their land. And one consider also mining in the American West. I did a big show on the art of mining. It's called Landscapes of Extraction, the Art of Mining in the American West. And it's quite clear that the Native American lands and the health of the Native Americans really suffers when mining, mining comes through because it's incredibly toxic. You use mercury, mercury to you know, help smelt copper. Um, and, but it has, it has affected Native lands very strongly. And I suppose that is an imperial act of imperialist act of mining. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question this evening. Yes. It's all on this side of the tracks. Thank you. Um, my question is actually for both scholars. Um, when you're doing primary source re research. How do you make sure that you're uh, balancing perspectives in a way that doesn't um, ultimately favor the perspective of the white colonizer? Like, how do you extract the indigenous perspective from this? I never decide what I'm going to write. I get the topic in mind, like mining or something. But what, when I decide what to write, I do a lot of research and stack it all up. And then I kind of look what I have and I try and figure out what's missing from that. And it's helpful to talk to a lot of other people. Because if you just sit in your cave and write by yourself, you will not, you might miss some things. I agree, absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, was a big kind of light bulb moment for me um, in, the, in the primary research for this book was reading sets of letters that had been read separately um, in different fields of history. So there's a field of business history and the historians have read, combed through the letters of the railroad executives um, with great detail and written a narrative just based on the letters of the railroad executives. There's a military history where these historians have combed through the letters of the generals, same process and written stories. But the generals and the railroad executives, the letters were back and forth, there were dialogues. So moving from one archive to the other, piecing together both sides of the letter Right, so, um, you know, Dodge is writing to Sherman in, in this one month. Sherman actually writes a direct reply back to Dodge. There's, you know, a back and forth. To piece together the dialogue, you actually get a fuller sense of the, of the history of, of what was taking place. And this, I think, was missed because people thought of themselves as a, I'm a historian of business, or I'm a historian of, of the military, rather than I'm a historian of this place. And letters are such wonderful sources. I tell my friends that I love to read other people's mail, dead people from the 19th century, but it's, it is a living history, but you also have to be careful because many of the letter writers are very conscious of history um, and how they might be perceived. So they're, but they're still really fun to see someone's handwriting from a particular era, um, like Stieglitz, like art, other, other artists, so. Sure. Great question. Um, so we have sources uh, left by um, different native indigenous nations. Um, some of the sources for Lakotas and Cheyennes are what are called ledger books. Um, and these, it's a genre of, of art, of visual art that um, began in imprisonment um, where, where people were being held as prisoners of war and they started drawing um, they started making drawings to remember um, experiences in the battlefield. And then they would tell others, these were kind of, you could say kind of visual mnemonics in a way. And um, these are used as sources. Um, historians, art historians can trace very specific dates, places, um, even people in the images to understand what is, you know, what's, what's being recorded here. So, those are, one, those are one type of evidence. Another would be called winter counts. These were a form of um, kind of a form of calendar mixed with oral history, where for each year there would be a symbol um, that would record, um, you know, let's say 1864, there'd be a certain symbol and it would record a significant story of what happened in 1864. Again, it's a device to kind of uh, jog, jog the memory 
And historians use these, again, not in general terms, but to actually talk about, to track, track up very specific places, people, and events, um, and oral history as well. One of the things that's really fascinating for me in studying the, the oral historical record of different indigenous nations is that um, claims that were being made in the 1970s in being recorded in oral histories are now being verified by historians using print sources. Um, so it's not to take the oral history and just say people said this and remember this, it must be true, but there's, there's a checking back and forth between the oral history and various types of print sources. Um, there's similar work that's being done with the under, Underground Railroad um, with the histories of slavery in the American South. Um, but there are always ways to find the voices, the experiences of oppressed communities, even ones who didn't necessarily write or keep their own records. And uh, we were just talking about um, historical philosophy and historical method. It's a very fascinating question. Yeah. And I've worked in women's studies for much of my career. I love resurrecting women artists who've been lost and then get found. And of course, those records have often been ignored. And so to put it in terms of Victor is not always the right thing, but there's just so many people who need to be reclaimed that aren't white male. Apologies to all the nice white men who are here. But um, you know, it's, it's a long, a long process, but it's a fascinating one when you can sort of bring someone back to life um, and there it is. So it's male helps with that, but other things do too, so. Thank you so much, both of you. So we'd just like to say thank you for coming out to Rosecliff or for joining us on Zoom. There is a reception on the terrace if you'd like to join us for that. Thank you again to Dr. Fulman and Dr. Karuga. Have a wonderful evening.